Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 40 of Sinking with Service Now. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. I've got Eddie McDonald with me today. Just the two of us, it's going to be good because we can have a little back and forth without all those other guys trying to talk over top of us. I'm just kidding, kind of, sort of. Um, so before we get started, let me do the uh, the Zintegra commercial. Zintegra is a ServiceNow partner. I am super excited that we're having conversations with customers of all sizes, helping customers of all sizes with ServiceNow. Um, you know, I was listening to a podcast around Fred Luddy uh, yesterday, Eddie, that um, talked about the history and where the company came from. In the very beginning, they had a problem. They would go to customers with this with this platform that didn't really do anything. But then customers would say, well, what does it do? And it says, well, you can do anything with it. And that I thought that was a really interesting statement. And then what they started to do, they started to build out you know, workflows within it so they'd have something to sell. And then customers started coming to them with workflows that they wanted in it. And they could either develop them to sell themselves uh, or um, ServiceNow would develop it within the product over time. And I thought about you guys and what I hear you talk about all the time. Um, that's kind of y'all's story, isn't it? It does. And I love that story. It reminds me of the Steve Jobs story when he created his first, quote, computer that was nothing more than the than the primary board. It didn't have a screen or a mouse or a keyboard. And the guy was like, what does this thing do? It's like it does whatever you want it to do. He needed yeah. to put it all together. And that's the same thing. Fred created the the structure but he didn't have anything that was customer facing. And once he did that with ITSM to be able to create the automation around ticket creation, the thing exploded. So yeah, I yep. really love that story. And then cloud happened and ITIL happened and it went from being, you know, just a bunch of computer hacks running the IT to actual professionals running IT. And next thing you know, everybody needed each other. And this thing was what brought them together in a business way. Uh, that's, that's the service now story. I, I, I can't wait to have my kids listen to the podcast and make sure they understand that. Cause if you just understand that, then you know how to start every service now conversation with every client out there, whether they're existing or whether they're new, uh, and help them get on the right page. And I, and I say all that because that's the Zintegra commercial. That's what we're out here to do is to simplify what it means to adopt service now, uh, whether it's in IT or in finance or HR or all across the uh, the company, and then turn around and be a partner that can help you get that implemented, supported, and help you grow it to the next phase. And doing podcasts like this is just, just part of the reason, part of the ways we do that is to proactively get in front of these conversations and lead them with what I call, you know, content with context where we have a discussion and people get to hear our thoughts on something ServiceNow has put together in a blog. Yeah. And, you know, that's a really interesting point because ServiceNow, I mean, it does so much, of course, but a lot of people don't understand what it can actually do. So I was just in Tampa this last week and, you know, I do a little presentation. And each time I do one of these presentations, I give a real world example of something that I built in my past. I had a background in development. So, I was talking about as an engagement manager, every time we got a new project, I'd have to go in and create the project in ServiceNow. I'd have to create all the associated tasks, all the workflows, the, the you know resourcing, all of that. And I'm, it was took a couple hours. And what I did is I spent eight or nine hours and created three or four project templates, depending on the type of project, I could click a button and it would spin up the project and it saved our entire PM team something like 800 hours a year off of 10 hours of work. It was so easy. So I use that as an example of, to your point, it can do so much. And our job is to identify what those challenges are and creatively come up with solutions with our customers. Yeah, appropriately where it meets the customer's needs, it's cost effective and it tees them up for the future, no matter what that future is. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Mike Sabia joined us. Look at that. What's up, Mike? I was busy, busy. Uh, apologies, I thought another I had another half hour. Uh, good afternoon. That's all right. Well, we we were we were talking smack about you, so you have to listen to what we said. Well, I was saying, I'm sure Mike's out has, helping a customer, just like we're saying here on the podcast. You're out doing so. No matter what the answer was, that's the answer. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> Um, so Mike, uh, Eddie and I identified this, uh, this blog we're going to go over today. It's called C-suite point of view, uh, top AI, top, top, top five challenges to AI adoption. And it's by a uh, VJ Kotu is how I'm going to say the last name. It's from August 15th, 2024. 
I listen to a ton of podcasts, as you guys know. We do a handful of podcasts, uh, but I listen to a ton. And this thing about uh, what to do with AI and how to make it make sense is reoccurring, no matter whether it's a technology podcast, uh, it's a podcast around a specific platform like ServiceNow in this case. Uh, but more often than not, it's the business guys trying to figure out where this thing's going. And all I, all I can tell at this point is they all don't want to miss out. So they're all investing, but they're not sure where it's going. Um, we are in an interesting space, specifically around ServiceNow in this conversation, but it could be Citrix, it could be VMware, it could be Microsoft. Every vendor we work with is adding AI into what they're doing. And so it's somewhat simple for us because all our job is, is to help that vendor's vision of AI get to its customers, whether it's a future customer, existing customer. Um, and so that's why you know companies like ServiceNow want partners like us to be you know, in thought leadership and helping explain what AI is to their clients and why it matters. Yeah. And, and what does it do? I mean, that's a big problem. I mean, everybody knows they need it, but, you know, is it productivity based? Is it, uh, um, is it about experience? Is it about building your business? I mean, what does it do? And by the way, it does all three of those things. Yeah. Um, but it really depends on, as we said a second ago, what's the business case and how do you step into it? Like anything else, you're not going to pull into, you're not going to go to the run phase out of the gate. You're going to crawl, walk, run into it because it's also data driven. So it's going to get better over time. So Eddie, going back to the conversation a few minutes ago, you know, the computer, Steve Jobs, what does it do? Well, it does what you tell it to do. This is where it gets interesting. Uh, it does what it needs to do, not necessarily what you have to tell it to do. Now, all of a sudden, with that data and with the uh, learning that goes along with it, it gets proactive instead of reactive, like that old calculator was just reactive to what you plugged into it. The, the computers up to this point have been kind of reactive now, all of a sudden, it starts to think on its own, a little scary from time to time. But when it comes to doing good business things, uh, it really can change uh, the results of what it, you I want to use a quick little example before we jump into this, because I was noodling on this a few days ago about AI. And it's not just the AI, but it's the people who use it have to learn how to use it. And I use the example of when you first got your first keyboard and you didn't know how to type. Writing was actually faster than typing because you didn't know where anything is. Now, once you know how to use a keyboard, you can type exponentially faster than you can write. And AI is the same thing. You're gonna have to get used to it and understand what it can do. And it's gonna get super, super fast and convenient. It might seem clunky out of the gate, but it's gonna get better over time. I'm I'm not sure if Mike's going to get a word in here because I'm going to jump. I I, I I want to get a couple words in there and let me, and let me get one more. Let me get one more. <laughs> please. I, I look at it as like a coach or a tutor. When I first started using a coach or better yet in school a tutor, it didn't really work until I learned how to use the tutor or the coach. And then all of a sudden it made it exponentially valuable to have that resource. But I had to really um, I had to train myself on how to use it, and then it became super valuable. Mike, go ahead. Well, I, I I think Eddie's example is a great one, especially when you need to choose to use AI. If you want to say, hey, I have a case and I want it to summarize it before I send an email to the customer. That is your decision to use AI. And ServiceNow absolutely supports it. But there are other AI situations where as leaders, we need to decide, hey, this is a place we need to put it in place. But what is in once it is in place, an individual doesn't need to do to decide. And I'll give you an example. So Today, we might have a number of servers and we might see that there should be an alert when disk drive hits 80%. Now, if we want to wait until it hits 80% or 95%, it can do that. But with AI, we can see, hey, this drive drive is at 78%, at, at just below our 88% threshold, but it's stable. That should be less concern than a disk drive that is at 70% still below, but is ramping up quickly. If we can have the AI look at those things intelligently, say, hey, this is an up and coming issue which is likely to impact you within the next week, then yeah. we can operationalize and improve. And that's something that can be set up without an individual deciding to, to, to choose AI. And, and Mike, I love that you gave that example on something very tactical uh, within IT. And then the future that, you know, very, uh, you know, expanded out around other lines of business like HR, for example, like it might be able to predict when an employee is going to, you know, retire or, or resign, you know, weeks or months before the manager can. Potentially. 
and you know you have to have some false positives you don't want to like start you know putting uh, people on notice or or the like uh, based on some suppositions but you want to highlight the possibility and then act upon it well maybe can, better, can it predict when i'm going to ask for a raise because that would be uh, nice to know uh, every, every, to everybody can predict that one <laughs> <laughs> But I guess maybe a different example is somebody's onboarding experience isn't going the way it should. It can proactively tell you that. So you as the manager can jump in and, and start to fix it versus, you know, having to hear a, um, a brand new employee complain about being unhappy. Absolutely. And I mean, as a perfect example of that is how long does it take to complete their onboarding task? You can evaluate, you know, all of those tasks. And it's like this person took twice as long as it should have. What is wrong there? Let's get ahead of that. So we didn't get a mishire. Yeah. All right, so uh, the, let me kind of read the, the the starting the opening paragraph. Generative AI, Gen AI, has disrupted how virtually every organization uh, operates. In fact, eighty one percent of organizations around the globe plan to increase their AI spend next year, according to Enterprise AI Maturity Index uh, by ServiceNow and Oxford Economics. But are they fully prepared? For this opportunity and how to take advantage of it and then it goes on to talk about um, some uh, research that was done recently and the takeaway from the idc world uh worldwide ceo survey from 2024 and from that they deduced uh, four or five of the following takeaways i'm going to start with the first one here uh, measure return on ai investments mike what is that and why does it matter for the well, CEO? well let me use an analogy right off so service now has a cost impact and for something like software asset management, SAM, there is a not insignificant cost to set that up. But once you set it up, the savings outweigh the costs considerably. And with AI investments, you need to choose where you're going to invest it and have a business case or proof that you're going to have the return you're expecting. So if you want to say, hey, we want to have case summarization so that the next person looking at a ticket or the end user looking at the, the, the ticket afterwards gets a quick summary without having to read all through all of it, that sounds fantastic, but you kind of need to prove where that the, the, the savings match your investment to it. That's a very and you need to example. do it beforehand. You just can't be all enamored with AI. Well, you can. But yeah, implement it. So we need to have what are the impacts that we're looking for? How can we measure those impacts to justify the cost? Because we have to look at the investment of AI and then look at what the results are going to be to make sure there's a business case there, just like anything else in IT. But but Eddie, I think for years and years and years, people have been enamored with, let's say, cloud, and they couldn't justify financially going there, but they were going there anyway. I'm not so sure AI is not like that too. If it's going to, well, it, it depends on the type of organization. You know, the cloud, the, the whole cloud conversation is one we can definitely have. But as far as the AI comes in, I look at it as another tool in the ServiceNow suite. And like anytime I'm looking at asset management or HR or security operations, I need to understand your cost. Where are, the, where are the stumbling blocks? What do you want to get better? And then I have to analyze that financially. So um, as far as our role at Zintegra, we need to make sure that every single thing that we're implementing for a customer means it makes sense from a business standpoint. And that's what we have to do. We have to find out what that cost looks like. Mike, anything else to add to this this first topic around uh, measuring return? Um, no, I think we've covered it fairly well. All right. Topic number two is AI governance. I didn't really, I mean, I hear on my political podcast and I'm talking about what to do around AI at the, you know, the government level. Uh, and then somebody has a product um, that I was talking to the other day. And not only they talk about the, you know, governing it, you know, within our government, but also uh, at the corporate level and, and making sure it aligns with the corporate strategy and policies. Um, Eddie, I'll come to you first on this AI govern governance. Why is that so important? Well, because people are scared. They're scared of it. You know, what's it going to do? What is it, what data is it going to have access to? Who's going to have access to the data? Um, you know, there's there's private personal data that can't be, you know, it's what does the AI have access to and how do we govern that? So ServiceNow, they actually built a governance app to manage the inventory of their AI models, including data, security, privacy, and performance. But that is something that ServiceNow got ahead of. They wanted to make sure that they can measure or control, you know, put the guardrails around the AI that is implemented based upon what the customer needs. Mike, thoughts? 
For sure. So I have a I have a friend, a buddy, and he's an accountant. And his company has standards about using AI. They're allowed to use it, but they have to only use abstract questions. Hey, find me the policy on this, this, this. Great. Uh, but you can't feed it any data that would represent the customer. And when we talk about ServiceNow and its uh, language model is LLM, ServiceNow has its own LLM. LLM excuse its own LLM in order to send that information within the ServiceNow ecosystem, but not outward. Now it is possible to extend ServiceNow to actually directly, you know, query chat GPT or open AI or the like, and that's possible. But if you're looking to leverage what ServiceNow has provided, it already has some of that governance around it. But as Eddie says, you need to have some governance about what you're doing, why you're doing it, to have clear clarity, not only for your end users, but your C-suite and the like. If anybody's unaware, if they're not, you know, used to using virtual agents, LLM stands for large language models. So Mike was, uh, there was just make sure everybody listening understands what that means. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm seeing products like the one I was kind of alluding to a minute ago pop up where there's companies that have software that sits in front of your AI usage or your AI development to make sure it aligns with company strategy or maybe government regulations. It's a... Uh, regulating AI within a company or the government is going to be a big business all in itself. Um, so let's see, Mike, back to you, because you're probably a great person to talk to this one about as a master architect, um, AI skills and talent strategy. Uh, I, pe people have to be uh, curious and interested on how they're going to get there and how they're going to keep up. Well, any customer who's looking to leverage AI absolutely wants to work with a partner who is familiar with uh, AI in general and what ServiceNow provides. And, you know, Eddie and I were talking about this this just this morning about how we can uh, ensure that we, Zentegra, are up to the challenge. And any customer who comes to us today, we'll have some of those same talking points. We'll talk about the value. We'll talk about governance. We'll talk about the skills we have, what talents we have to accomplish that. And, you know, as with any company, we're going to be growing that. We're going to be making sure that the appropriate people, not just Eddie and myself, are fully familiar. So, you know, abstractly, you want to make sure that you have the correct people not say, hey, we're implementing AI. You want to have the, the business process people aware of what you're accomplishing. You want technical people like myself or my colleagues to say, what does this mean to actually implement it? What does it mean to uh, structure it in an appropriate way? What does it mean to, to do it in an appropriate way? So this, this article or this uh, paragraph or section of the article, it starts off with, according to IDC research, 60% of CEOs report the organizations don't have the skills to implement AI initiatives. That's probably higher than that, to be honest with you. And then it goes on to talk about what ServiceNow is doing. So I love that Mike brought up what we're doing because at the end of the day, every customer, no matter how big or small, how successful or not successful, they should have a partner they can lean on for ServiceNow and AI pieces or both, uh, vice versa even. Um but there's, there's this next part that talks about ServiceNow believing in low-code and no-code AI development. And while that's true, that didn't say low-code, no-code, or unskilled. There's still going to have to be skills that go along with that to be able to coach the solutions and train the solutions or you know tee up the solutions and then how to know how to get the most out of the solutions. Eddie, do you agree with that? I do. And and to your point, yes, low code and no code is are very buzzworthy. Um, but you absolutely need a technical expert in service now to do this. But more importantly, it always begins with process. And to try to implement something like AI strategy into a broken process is only going to make that broken process dance. We have to make sure you're following good or best practice around AI and around whatever process we're putting the AI on top of to make sure that you're going to get the value. And that's what we do. Or, I mean, our entire team is ITIL V4 certified. So we are going to have those best practice conversations before we even get into the technical. Yeah. So because I'm going I'm to skip number four because number five always comes out to me first. Uh, ahead of number four. Number four is probably the one that trumps them all, I guess. Uh, but number five is prioritizing the right use cases. How do you do that when there's so many use cases that you see evolving in front of you by the minute? Well, it, it, I think it goes back to what we talked about a minute ago about finding the business case. 
So, you know, you might need it in your help desk, you might need it in your project management team, you might need it in your security team. But if you've got 80 people on your help desk and you have five project managers, you know, looking at the business case, if we can save your help desk people 30 minutes a day each, and we can save your project managers an hour a day each, it makes way more sense to implement the use case around the biggest return on investment for your help desk. So right. I think it would start there. And I, I would also tie in the business imperatives. Hey, what are you trying to improve? You know, when we do a service now implementation, we want to say, we ask the question, hey, what are you trying to improve? Are you simply need a, a product that replaces something that's no longer supported? That, that's pretty straightforward. But if you're looking to increase customer satisfaction, either, hey, these the, the, the interface is old and clunky, or, hey, I want to improve customer interface, customer experience, because I want to be proactively aware of issues before they happen, or I want uh, to increase KPIs around um, time to resolve tickets. Uh, it all depends on the, the KPI, what imperative you want to improve. And if this customer satisfaction, we're going to focus on uh, case summarization or some of that proactive uh assessment if you're looking up at you know time to speed up the process those are different ai challenges and that's where we would focus i heard process improvement i heard customer satisfaction i heard cost reduction or avoidance mm -hmm. i mean and they could just keep coming like like i don't i don't know how we do it i don't know how you guys do it on your team i don't know how you guys help a customer figure that out or do they just typically come with their priorities and we help them with their priorities or do we push back trying to point them to better places to prioritize first? We I mean, ask part of really the, good questions. We ask questions the, that make them unfold their dirty laundry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of partners who will listen and say, hey, this is what you want and they'll do it. But we try to be a little more proactive to say, hey, what are you really trying to accomplish? So I'm gonna sometimes go back to that means we have to go a little bit up the food chain because what's important to the help desk manager might not be as important to the director of IT. So we need to understand what the overarching we're gonna we're gonna address the tactical while keeping the strategic back of mind. Yeah, I, I don't know what you just said that made me think about it, but in the podcast again, listen to the story of Service Now, and they they talked about it just being a help desk tool and. It's just like what I say to people all the time. If if you're looking at a help desk tool, you you don't need it because you're you're gonna woefully under leverage it. Um, all right, uh, number four. Um, and this is what I assume most CEOs care about the most. Maybe not. Maybe if they're thinking about driving their business forward, but the the cost concerns. Um, AI is going to be expensive, and there's no guarantee that you're going to get your money back out of it. But I don't think companies can afford not to. Let me read the quote here. They how call it out in the picture here. Uh, IDC predicts that uh, by 2026, organizations infusing AI into their business models could see double the revenue growth compared to their peers. Guys, is that rhetoric or is that real? Potentially it could be. When we were at not the Knowledge Conference back in May, um, one of the big presentations they had was a little bakery and they were using AI to determine uh, when customers would come through the door. Oh, there's a conference next door. Oh, this is the student season. Oh, this is how many we're selling now. And all of those things informed how many muffins or bread or donuts they, they created. And so it can directly affect sales. Absolutely. But that means that you have a, a way to measure all of those items. So, you know, we talked a little bit you know, about the customer satisfaction and, and, uh, 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 proactive identification of possible alerts. But if you want to really go even a further state, you need to go back to the business process. What are you trying to accomplish? And and how is that going to improve maybe your, your revenue? And, uh, and, it, and it goes back, just use it. You have to use it. And Mike and I had a conversation and Fred Reynolds and I had the same conversation Way, way more often than not, we talk to a customer and they aren't using a fraction of what they're currently licensed for in their service now environment. So if they've got ITSM, that includes incident problem change, knowledge request, asset, seem to be virtual agent, and they're using three of those applications. So there's they wonder why they're not getting the value. This is the same thing. 
If you're going to license the AI, we need to understand your immediate business case and all the other associated cases where we can apply this tool to get that value. So the cost concern is valid, but they have to be, they have to put their resistance to change in their pocket and look at what's possible if they're going to make the investment. Well, and, you know, we talked about our commercial at the beginning of this. There, there are a ton of customers out there that have implemented service now, and now they're talking about doing AI with it, and they really haven't gotten the value out of it that they started to get out of it. And that's just, that's the easiest opportunity for us to come in and help a customer write the ship around service now and prepare them for the AI investment that's going to help them, you know, with this, with this quote. A hundred percent. I would all, I would actually push back on somebody trying to implement AI into a really terribly implemented existing platform. We need to clean it up, put it on stable ground, nice foundation and scale from there. Yeah. Which goes back to the, you know, the origin of this whole platform around getting a common database for uh, all things IT so that you, you have a platform, you have a foundation and you can make smart decisions going from, going from that, that, uh, that position of knowledge. Um, I think we covered what well, we did cover. We covered the five. Uh, it says the bottom line is AI adoption presents a transformative opportunity for business. Leaders must navigate these five challenges to realize the full potential of AI, uh, staying proactive and adaptable, adaptable, extremely important to what's coming next. Um, Mike, as a recap or as a summary of this, anything we didn't cover you think matters? Um, I think we covered a lot. You, you need your use cases, but and you need a foundation, as just Eddie just mentioned. If you're not fully utilizing the product, it might be better to consider those before we jump into AI. But knowing that AI is possible, knowing that you have a platform that can grow to it is super helpful. But as you start considering AI, look at what your imperatives are. Look at what you're trying to improve. Maybe it's something customer satisfaction. Maybe it's being proactive. Maybe it's you know speeding up your ticketing. But if you want to go even further into, hey, how do we change our business model? Uh, that's even further discussion, possibly beyond just ServiceNow. But ServiceNow provides a, a great framework for starting a governance to keep it secure, uh, to enable, to uh, you know get your your foot in the door, and then grow from there. Yeah, I, I love that you brought that up because, like you know, we see it. Um, ServiceNow brings all of our tech and other things together, and then does like, allows us to do things with that data, you know, back out. Um, ServiceNow in that model, the AI associated with it could be AI enabling for all the other stuff it touches. Yeah. And, it, and at the end of the day, you know, anybody listening to this, if you're still a novice in AI and most people are, you just have to put that resistance to change in your pocket. Like I said, you've got to embrace it because it's inevitable. It's coming. You're either going to get on board or get left behind. So do your research, you know, reach out, ask us some questions. We're happy to meet with you, whether you're an internal folk, a service now, you know, seller or a customer. We're welcome to share our, our knowledge and expertise. But at the end of the day, it's going to have to be a switch that goes off internally with each person that says, yes, let's do it. Let's get a plan together and execute. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're building this for that moment with the idea that we're going to help customers once and it's going to create this you know, flywheel effects where we're helping them achieve, you know, what the, what the article says, which is by 2026, you know, double revenues. Well, that in theory with AI is just going to continue to evolve and happen and happen and happen. And the companies that take advantage of it are going to get the benefit. The companies that don't will be left behind. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Well, guys, I appreciate the time today and uh, look forward to doing this again in two weeks. All right. Very good. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week.